the film coming up is a three-way conversation between me, Daniel Thorson of the Emerge podcast, and Josh Fields, who's the CEO of Consciousness Hacking. And it's on the topic of existential risk and collapse, which is something Daniel's been covering a lot on his podcast, and Josh has also been delving really deeply into it, as he'll outline in the film. And it was recorded uh, a little while ago, a couple of months ago, during the Extinction Rebellion protests in London, but it feels like the right time to release it now. And it's hard to imagine a more important topic, but also one that's really hard to grasp and in some ways quite paradoxical, which is what I try to outline in the first part of the film. At the same time that, that we, we are talking about collapse and there are these kind of very convincing arguments, very convincing models, it's still the case that for most people on the planet, this is the best time yet to have been alive um, in terms of wealth, in terms of quality of life and all those things. Like that's something that I'm kind of very conscious about putting a flag in early because I know that our audience, quite rightly, some of them can be very kind of reactive to that, the whole idea of it, because especially the sort of the original Peterson audience, Jordan Peterson audience, because he, he talks a lot about that, yeah. like that we're not, we're nowhere near grateful enough for the achievements of Western civilization, right. et cetera, et cetera. How do you hold that kind of right. tension? That, that is, that is probably the deepest paradox of our times, right? It's this, um, Steven Pinker, um, enlightenment, uh, truth that, that's held by a lot of these thinkers like Peter Diamandis, Stephen Pinker, that we are in an exponential age of progress and simultaneously we're collapsing and simultaneously, you know, we, we, we're desecrating ecosystems. So life expectancy has almost doubled uh, since 1900. Almost the whole world is literate and child mortality is reduced by 50% since, like, since, <clears throat> since 1990. And yet this seems to be becoming the cost of the very planet we call home. And so this is the thing, like, I think where the left go wrong is they say, you know, we're in this like terrible, terrible, these, these, these like um, apocalyptic times and it's all humanity's fault. And what, it, what, what a lot of that narrative misses is that we've, we're also in, in the best times. And that's something that I struggle, really, really struggle to hold. And they call that the environmentalist paradox, but both are true. Jen Bindel holds a truth. Steven Pinker holds a truth. One is a collapsologist and a catastrophist. The other is the enlightenment. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, a little bit. Precisely. Yeah. And I just think what is being called for here is some sort of synthesis yeah. that sees these truths as only half true. Mm -hmm. And that we have to find a way through into this, you know, really, really celebrating progress while also being um, realistic as to the implications of said progress. Yeah. Yeah, I resonate a lot with that, and um, I think the danger in any case is, from my perspective, sort of collapsing into certainty. Like, we know how it's going to go. We know that it's going to be a kind of catastrophic collapse, or we know that it's going to be, you know, exponential beauty for the rest of time. I think both of those perspectives seem quite dangerous to me, if you hold on to it with certainty. So really, that's the kind of rub of it for me. And we've talked about this before, Joshua. It's like, uh, yeah, can we, can we hold both of those perspectives without needing the easy certainty that either could offer if it's held in the wrong way? And which, for this question to both of you, which, what's the most convincing model or evidence or narrative that you've seen that persuades you that the collapse narrative is true for people maybe who haven't been exposed to it or who haven't delved as deeply into it as sure. you guys have? So um, I, I started researching for a thesis edit at CIIS and um, what are the parallels between our current predicament and civilizations that have gone before? And I think there are three really um, simple mechanisms that are very self-evident in our current situation that are also um, implicit in the literature as to what some of the causes of collapse have been in the past. Um, the first is pure environmental degradations. If you look, Jared Diamond um, was, is the kind of magnum opus on this, but societies and civilizations that come out of alignment with their natural ecosystems are societies that are destined to fail. Um, so we, we have environmental degradation as one mechanism. We have complexity as another. This is Joseph Tainter's work. I'm not going to go into them, but if you look at our complexity situation just now, it's exponential complexity, linear competence, 
the more these two curves decouple, the higher the probability we're not going to be able to make sense of that complexity. And then the third is inequality. So if you look at this, there's various models that show how stable or unstable a society is. Um, and if you input, like, there's a model called Handy, H-A-N-D-Y. Um, and really these models are just indicators of systemic instability. Inequality being a huge variable and where we are just now with inequality, I think, um, is pretty easy to see. So this combination of environmental degradation, excess complexity and excess inequality are three very, very clear mechanisms that have led to collapse in the past. Mm -hmm. And they are being expressed in fortitude and, and, and um, so with such clarity in our current predicament. Mm -hmm. um, I have oscillated between um, in being an inevitabilist and um, a utopianist to some degree. Tech will save us or we're all doomed. And to go to your point, I think the, the, the quality of consciousness that I've attempted to start to cultivate is one of uncertainty. How do we provide, how do we maintain stability within that uncertainty? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I guess I, everyone's proxying their sense making to someone or something at some level. In, in this debate, unless you've gone deeply into the kind of the original research, like everyone. And I guess if I was kind of to, to bring a sort of skeptical perspective that I'm holding as well, <clears throat> is I'm very skeptical of the range of certainty. Like we're surrounded at the moment, we're, we're recording this in London, Extinction Rebellion is going on. And I have a sort of deeply ambivalent relationship to Extinction Rebellion. I think it's fantastic that a movement has kind of come from almost nowhere and has uh, making environmental collapse such a such a feature of yeah. the political landscape, while at the same time I'm concerned that it seems to be collapsing a very complex narrative into a very simple one, and also I'm I'm, I'm also concerned about the particular actions that they're urging to be taken and whether they will be effective. But but what I'm what I'm more skeptical of I think is something like Extinction Rebellion, the sort of environmental catastrophism that we're seeing at the moment just seems to map so perfectly onto kind of a deep religious substructure of um, Armageddon, um, sin, repentance, all of, all of these things just seem so, di so deeply kind of woven into the, um, yeah, the mythological substructure of our thinking that the, the, the fact that it maps on so even even like the Greta Thunberg kind of child so that, prophet, it's yeah. it's just it's so and I, I would have more I don't see many people in these environments saying acknowledging that. Like I, I think you have to at least acknowledge that before you can say, yes, it does seem to map on to all of these things, mm -hmm. but at the same time we think that the that this is different for some reason or whatever. Mm. Do you have any concerns about that kind of um, framework? So there's a couple of things. The first is the first piece is you, you, you're skeptical of the reductionism, mm. right? That there's this call for, and and this is the problem with a lot of the climate movement. It's that if we just stay below the two degree mark, the the, the, the two degree mark of warming, and however many par parts per of carbon per in the atmosphere will somehow save things. Um, that, for me, is an expression of an ontology that is about to be left behind, which is mm. scientific materialism. That we can understand the universe in reality by chopping it up into small parts, yeah. identifying the a, a certain variable that is wrong, yeah. solving for that variable so we solve, solve for the whole complex system. Yeah. I know you've had Jordan and Daniel on this, this, this very important difference between complexity and complicated systems. Mm. The two degree reductionist framework that Extinction Rebellion and Greta Thunberg really um, are, are advocates of, it's, uh, it, it's materialist thinking. It's reductionist materialist thinking. So I think it's linear as well in, a, in an effectively non-linear system. Yeah, I mean, the IPCC are trying to account for non-linearity right, in, their, in, their, in their predictions. Um, it's just too simplistic. Yeah, but what's, I guess I'm, I'm left with a question of like, what is the alternative for a mass movement? Is there an alternative? And, and if not, are you, is there no role for this kind of 
mass uprising and consciousness. Because I, I, yeah, I don't really see how that would function with the kind of complexity lens. Mm -hmm. Like the problem is everywhere and nowhere. Yeah, but you can, that's the problem. You can't have a mass movement that doesn't have a defined, like Extinction Rebellion has to have a defined set of demands. You can't get people out onto the streets to protest if you don't have a defined set of dem demands. Well, you can, but then like Occupy there in 2008, they did, but they didn't, they had people out in the streets without, they just like changed the system and then it got nowhere because there weren't any clarified objectives. Yeah. Well, it did expand the Overton window, which allowed things like minimum wage to go up and people to fight for other policy changes that, you know, were quite good. So I think, I think it's, um, my, my sense is that it's easy to demand too much of something like Extinction Rebellion, mm. right? And uh, I often, you know, it's, it's important to remember something like, you know, uh, Rosa Parks refusing to sit down on the bus and the actual civil rights legislation were years apart, right? Mm. These kind of things move in very nonlinear ways. Consciousness kind of works itself into reality in complex ways, right? And so we can't, I don't expect Extinction Rebellion to like solve the world, but I also see that it's pointing us in a direction that it's very important. And this, uh, this piece about the mythological and the archetypal, yeah. um, it's, it's, so, it's so true. And first of all, I'd push back on, first of all, why is that problematic? Okay, mm -hmm. like just because it is some sort of like, there's a kind of, it's um, matching our archetypal frameworks and we're projecting archetypes onto reality, whatever else. Um, I don't know if that's a bad thing. Mm -hmm. And second of all, I think it's also, it points to a deeper truth that we are living in deeply mythological times. Mm -hmm. Like this loss of truth from public discourse, Trump, Boris, mm -hmm. this scaled level of deceit. This is like, there are the, the number of texts that have spoken to the importance of truth and what happens when truth is lost in the myths. You know, this is Sodom and Gomorrah stuff. This is, you know, the, the loss of the Aryans was supposedly because of the loss of truth. And mm. um, Sir John Glubb, a British historian, wrote in 1972 that just prior to civilizations collapsing, they lose values like truth. Mm. So I think there is a mythological substructure to our current predicament. Yeah. And I don't necessarily know what is, and I, I think that's for a reason. I'll say one other yeah. thing to that though. Rick Tarnas speaks about um, the apocalypse archetype. Mm. And that perhaps that if we are able to actually go through apocalypse internally in the psyche, we don't actually have to play it out in the external world. Mm. And this is this call we to consciousness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This call to consciousness is, and this is my, my big interest is consciousness is, are we able to integrate that apocalypse archetype internally? Yeah. And if so, yeah. how does that play out in the dynamics of, of, of the world. Yeah, and before it has to happen materially, mm -hmm. right? Because in, uh, in the work of James Hillman, I recently had a conversation with Zach Stein where he focused <laughs> on this. Uh, you want it to happen... So James Hillman is the, the Jungian analyst who was sort of one of the most... Um, yeah, he, he created archetypal... Since, since Jung. Mm -hmm, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, imaginal psychology. Um, yeah. But he wrote a book called Suicide and Soul. And the idea there is that you want to encourage it in, on the level of metaphor, archetype, and consciousness so that it doesn't have to be reified into the material and the organic. Mm -hmm. And I think that's exactly what you're pointing to. And it's why I see that archetypal function of something like Extinction Rebellion as actually being mm -hmm. good, necessary mm -hmm. even, in order to provide for the, a context in which deep transformation can happen collectively. Mm -hmm. I guess my, my point would be, if you're asking sort of why does it matter or, or whether it's a, a good thing or not, is that my, my concern is that if we're playing out of these, these roles, like there've been millenar millenar millenarian <clears throat> panics before, like there was one around the turn of the, 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 the first millennium. Like there was, another, we had another one, the Y2K bug, you could argue was a sort of similar like, like we're, we're very prone to these kind of um, apocalyptic movements or thoughts that seem to be very deeply rooted and are obviously, I mean, they're as deeply rooted as it gets because they're in Christian mythology. You've got the whole, yeah. um, we, we don't know when, when we're actually in um, the book of Revelations. And there's a there's a whole yeah. subsector of that, like rapture mythologies and, and revelation yeah. mythologies that we that. Um, Jamie Wheel talks about the, the, the talk that he's going to be giving 
in a couple of weeks' time is actually called Recapture the Rapture from the kind of Silicon Valley um, rapture uh, theologians, you might say, and then the, the Christian theologians, the ISIS. Like, there's a lot of this kind of thinking around. Like, how do we know that this one is different from the? Because this 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 belief pattern seems common to many different groups, and I think it, it's certainly more more um, mainstream Guardian reading middle class to be in the climate cult than in one of the other cults. But there's very similar similar dynamics in a lot of these cult, these sort of belief systems. Completely, and I think that's, that's an important piece to point out is that there is a meaning crisis, mm. and as a as a result of that meaning crisis, what better a an excuse to 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 inject meaning than the end of the world? We can save humanity, and we have a hero leading us called Greta. Yeah. Like this is deeply mythological, agreed. Yeah. At the same time, there is some decent science to support this, but also, uh, at least in my own studies, that even the, the, the theory itself, even without the empirics of exponentially extractive technology in a limited ecosystem, cannot sustain itself in our current model. Um, but, I, but I think it's... it's uh, there's something very clear, there's a very clear connection between this uh, desperation for meaning mm. and this fitting that jigsaw puzzle really well in our collective psyche. And is there, an, do you have, is there a sense that that's a problem from your perspective? Because I see that too and, and, you know, I think that's actually very compelling. Mm -hmm. uh, it's certainly a part of how I construct my meaning in my life is around this time that we live in, that it could very well be, perhaps is, and I can act as if it's an age of transition. Mm. And that that doesn't in, in amplify the meaningfulness of my human life. Mm. I suppose David's point is though that if, that does that make it true? Just because it's satisfying some meaning making right. longing, does it make it true? Um, yeah, I mean this is, you mentioned the meaning crisis and this is this is something that's very, very hard to talk about because of um, because there's a lot. There was the backlash against the Greta speech, and then there was the sort of backlash against that. And anyone who was sort of seen to criticise or at least question her role was seen as kind of, oh, look at all of these kind yeah. of angry men getting upset by a sixteen-year-old child, and this sort of very strange dynamic. But it's very true. Just even looking at her own words and her, her parents' words, the solution to Greta's personal meaning crisis is the crusade that she's on now mm -hmm. like they say that she's she i mean if, if you if you look at the 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 level of difficulty and um dysfunction in her family and uh, her personally like it was it was real really hell like for her and her sister growing up and um they finding this cause has given her a, a kind of a real purpose and a real so there is something about the meaning crisis playing out in this. And also there's the sense of uneasiness about what is personal and what is collective, because I, I'm pretty sure I haven't read the book, but I've read a review of it, that the narrative inside the Thunberg household was if the world was sorted, then Greta would be fine or the children would be fine, that they're just basically acting out uh, the trauma of the world rather than the personal trauma of the family. And everything I know about personal growth and psychology says that that's not the case. Um, so there's also this kind of deep concern about what is, like with act, with activists more generally, like what is personal trauma being projected out onto the world and what is um, the world calling for in terms of ac action? And there's a huge dynamic. I mean, there's an, multiple different motivations for lots of different people involved in these movements as well. Like you wouldn't say like hey, everyone involved in Extinction Rebellion is traumatized and protecting that onto the world, but there is a there is certainly a dynamic there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and it, I think it's important to remember, it, it, even when I reflect on my time with Occupy Wall Street, which I organized with in New York City, it's like, it's so um, easy to provide a kind of unifying narrative of what that was or what XR is. But it too is a complex phenomenon. Like if you go down there, it is complicated. Or no, it's not complicated, it's complex, right? It's like 
very self-organizing. It's very emergent. Everybody there has different reasons, different things that are calling them forth. Even the meaningfulness that they get from being there is different for seemingly just about everybody. Yeah, there are family resemblances, but it's you can't reduce it into a single perspective or you know kind of way of seeing what it is. Uh, that it is happening to me is more interesting than trying to offer some kind of uh, interpretation of it, right? What, why is it being called forth now? And I, I think that speaks into the archetypal piece. Um, and I, I also don't really, yeah, see it as a problem. I mean, with Greta, I think that what that speaks to to me is, is any time that we put somebody else up on a pedestal, be it Greta or Daniel Schmachtenberger or Jordan Greenhall or Jordan Peterson or Bonita Roy, uh, we are stepping outside of, I think, what the world is asking for us to do right now, which is step into our own sense making and become an agent unto ourselves that can move forward in a build way that. Build ourselves that's, a pedestal. Yeah, build our, put ourselves on a pedestal. Yeah, yeah. There's a way in which I believe that to be true. Yeah. But I'm also concerned about this kind of reduction of the complex bio system strains into one single variable of global warming sure. and climate like that that's that seems to me the most unsolvable and unmeasurable part of the whole picture and what it also does it, it rejects that well why why do we have capitalism and why you know if 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 it was easy as just taxing the hell out of carbon and reducing fossil fuels why don't we just do it and the reason we don't do it is your my food your food your shelter our water is completely dependent upon the system remaining kind of like it is. Mm. And you saw the, the Jean Vests in France protesting last year. That was over a, a tax on fuel, okay? That was a tax on fuel and it led to complete and utter anarchy in the streets of Paris for days on end. So it's not quite as simple as saying we can like rapidly reduce carbon to net zero by 2025 and somehow things will be sorted because the, 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 the tragedy of duality Mm. is that that will then bring about its own social catastrophe. Yeah. So we're just, we're kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place. Um, it skipped my mind what I was going to say before, but um, in terms of you, you saying before, Daniel, that really stepping into the world with their own sense-making capacities like, and really not proxying leadership too much to other people, um, what, the, what really trying on collapse has felt like to me, I... I went through reading the literature and going into a little bit of like panic and like we're fucked. Moving into hopelessness and apathy. Um, but then eventually what happened and as I then started to digest this process of grief and rather than this like nothingness that was kind of embodied, that was kind of embodying in this hopelessness, the, the other side of grief definitely feels and felt, felt and feels more like a call to action that is clean. It's, uh, you know, those coffees, uh, those coffees you go for with people who you don't really want to go for. They, they kind of like the trivial things that you say yes to out of some sort of social conformity. Trying on claps as an archetype and really feeling its implications can actually lead to, I think, a very he healthy and positive response. Mm -hmm. It's not all catastrophizing. That may just be a necessary intermediary step to get to the clean phase transition by which we want to emerge. Yeah, I think that's really well said, and that was what was occurring to me too, David, as you were speaking, is that there is a kind of, there are different ways to hold this archetype, and I think that, or this kind of way of seeing, uh, and we might look at and talk more specifically about the difference in maturity that different uh, manifestations are holding this with, right? And so... I notice too in the way that I've been relating to collapse. What what I found is that it causes me to to um, reinvest myself into my community, into those around me. It offers a kind of clarifying energy mm -hmm. to not uh, spill my energy into the world in ways that don't serve my local context, really. And and. Um, you know, I can walk through Extinction Rebellion as I've been kind of exploring it over the last couple of days, and I can see some people are holding this, and it's causing them to panic. Mm. It's causing them to freak out. And there are others who are holding it, and it's causing them to kind of 
step into themselves, mm -hmm. go on a kind of hero's journey, to become more heroic mm -hmm. through Extinction Rebellion. And so it's serving these both these purposes at once for yeah. different people. And, and at least in my experience, the panic was the intermediary stage to yeah. the centering. Yeah, I feel, I feel that same sense of alignment personally, and that same sense of kind of um, need to step up to be equal to the times. And I felt it from the moment that, pretty much from the moment that Trump was elected, it was like, because I could just see quite clearly how, like I'm a foreign affairs journalist originally by, by um, vocation, and I could just see, okay, all of these, um, all the things that were put in place after the Second World War to kind of keep um, to keep the peace from the UN to NATO to, um, yeah, what to all, all of these international organizations, Trump was going to demolish or was going to, to go so individualist that we were back to the age of sort of great power politics in a multipolar world. And that that was, so that was a kind of maybe an intimation of collapse. Like I think we're still, we still have yet to see it play out, but. I look at all of these different vectors from the politics to uh, the environmental to all of these different things. And I think part of the narrative, this is my other, I don't want to just kind of feel like we're focusing solely on Extinction Rebellion here, but in this instant, instance of it, what I feel is the collapse is so multivaried and so pervasive. And it's also interesting that Extinction Rebellion has happened in the UK, where I think our political system is going through this sort of death experience like a real um, national breakdown in many ways is like we're picking up this this sense of collapse through so many different uh, areas of our lives um, Jordan Greenhall says you can even look at it in Hollywood movies like you're running there just things are running out of road in all these different ways because we've the, we're um, just running out of different ways to all, all the roads are being played out at the same time so that, that's my other concern with something like Extinction Rebellion or something like an activist response to this time is it's going to, it's taking this this whole dynamic of the system and collapsing it into one particular narrative, um, carbon, for example. And, and, and it's time to like, yeah, just to be able to sense all the different ways that things are coming to the end at the same time is, is something I think that's really something I'm drawn to and that, and that's, But that, that exact point is, is my pushback to people who are climate skeptics, mm -hmm. is that, let's say the planetary boundary framework... They don't believe the climate exists. They don't they think that, that it's not even real. Yeah. Uh, the planetary boundary framework um, from the Stockholm Resilience Centre identifies nine planetary boundaries. Um, if, one, if humanity breaches one of those boundaries, Earth, according to this model, is no longer a safe operating system for humanity. Climate change is one of those boundaries, right? We've already passed four of them. Others, you know, others are like, you know, biodiversity. Um, and so if you look at, you don't just have to be looking at climate change to know that things are fundamentally wrong. The complexity of our institutions, the, the, our, our, our inability to actually make decisions mm -hmm. in our political systems. Like these are all symptoms of much, much deeper structural issues. Yeah. And also, for example, <clears throat> the biodiversity one's a really interesting one because you're looking at the effect of pesticides. You're looking at the effect of, um, I, I look at like the mental health crisis and another one. It's like the, 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 the materialist paradigm that does not appreciate living systems at all and has been kind of imposing this very um, simplistic mechanistic narratives on so many areas of our planet as is is probably the closest to sort of the the root cause of a lot of things we're yeah. seeing it's like uh, the, the medical one is like the the, the mental health the catastrophe of mental health in in the west is just astonishing addiction levels um and and, and this is also deeply interlinked so the mental health crisis, for me, it's a crisis of trauma mm -hmm. to a large degree. And people are feeling depressed and anxious because their nervous systems are unable to handle the, 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 the intensities of modern life. And mm -hmm. most of our coping mechanisms are, are to, to go numb to the pain. It's too much to handle, too much to hold. Mm -hmm. And I think part of our numbness, uh, part of the, the implications of our numbness is that we are dead to the living systems by which we partake. We are dead to the damage we're doing to the environment. We're dead to the damage mm. we're doing to each other. 
And I think it's also this, there's a loss. Sometimes I just like look around and like this, sometimes I just feel like this lack of vitality. Yeah. It's like life force, life isn't navigating its way or through us as living systems or through our living systems as a whole in a way that it, that, that it, that it wants to. Yeah. Um, there's a deadening. And I think this is really what's being called for. It's like this transition is into a transition of... You don't see many obese animals unless they've been right. kind of <laughs> pretty <laughs> abused, domesticated. thoroughly domesticated and abused. Like the, na the natural world is self, is self or depressed animals. I mean, it's just a, it's a human... Yeah, dynamic. yeah. Well, there's also, I think, what you're pointing to, Joshua, is that there are other ways of knowing, right, that we've also lost access to. And I think this is what you're saying. There's been a kind of, like, monoculturing of our epistemologies mm -hmm. that you know, it's, you have to have a conversation, like, is it true that collapse is happening? Can I really believe it? But, like, it, after I sit a retreat mm -hmm. and then I walk into the cities, like, the streets of New York City, which I've done before, I wouldn't recommend it. It's very overwhelming. You can, if you listen to yourself in a different way, you could be like, this is, there's something not right here. There's something that's not working here. Like, and that can give, that offers me a different way in to understanding the dynamics that are at play right now. And that we don't trust that, that we're like, oh, well, you know, that's just a feeling. Mm, right. This, this is the, this is, I think, again, this, the paradigm shift that has to come when people speak about the rise of the feminine in, in hippie language. What it quite simply is, is the, um, the, the understanding that rational abstraction is only a single way of knowing. Yeah. And that really the parts of our bodies that know, um, that, that are to do with our survival aren't abstract. Mm -hmm. It's, it's a very deep somatic way of being. And I think what modern culture has done, it's either condemned them as like girly, mm -hmm. weak, um, or just not as accurate a sense-making mechanism. And in so doing, has actually shut us off. Because ultimately, this is the thing. If we knew what we were doing, we would stop. Mm -hmm. But in order to know, you can't just think. It has to be felt. Yeah. And I think, and I feel, that this is where a lot of the action isn't um, isn't taking place. It's because we're still at this level of reason. And reason is failing. I mean, look at... This is this collapse of sense-making. We've lost this postmodern, you know, relativism means reason isn't even cutting it anymore. It has to come back to the body. It has to come back to feeling. I'm interested to come back to the trajectory you talked about before that you had become very, very pessimistic, but yeah. you're not so pessimistic anymore. Do you want to explain why, why yeah. outline why? So when I, when I read de Deep Adaptation and I get deep into the catastrophist lens, it's a very convincing narrative, right? When I feel the damage, it's a very convincing felt experience. Um, but according, going back to my earlier point is I, my sense is these are partial perspectives and the partial perspective of the catastrophist is that it ignores, it ignores what exponential technology actually means. Um, that to use Daniel Sch Schmachtenberger's language phase shift, I don't think we can quite fathom what is coming when we start to merge all of the latest social technologies and physical technologies and elevated states of consciousness together into a new, mo new model. And so I think, um, I think shit is going to get really real. Mm. And I think the one lens to look at that is to kind of close up and say the world is going to end. And another way to look at that is to say there's, there's this uh, massive opportunity for us to step in to quite literally the next phase of our species evolution. Or die trying. Or die trying. At the same time, I, I just think, again, it's this paradox and this necessity to hold both. That Steven Pinker, partial truth. Jem Bindel, partial truth. We're collapsing and we're innovating. And what we're going to emerge into, like, you know, we're in this birth canal and we're kicking and screaming and it's very, you know, Stan Gross having a great time thinking, like, what is, what is happening in the collective psyche right now? 
we're, we're kind of in to use, we're in BPM three. We're in, we're in this deep state of we think we're going to die. Mm. And in BPM three, do, do have you heard, you know, BPM three is like standard. Perinatal matrix. Perinatal matrices. Perinatal matrix. Yeah. But perinatal matrices of Stan Groff that says each, um, we all go through like, there are four perinatal matrices is when you're in the womb, mm. when you're about to come out the womb, when you're being literally coming out the womb. And then when you, when you're free and psychedelic experiences map onto those BPMs, um, we're in this fighting with, we don't want to be, we don't want to move out from our comfortable space. Um, we're in that. And I just yeah. think we have to have trust that the evolution of consciousness is so um, ingenious that if we align with the correct forces of evolution, mm. what is going to emerge will be more beautiful. And yet it's going to fucking hurt. Mm. So when I've left, left behind the catastrophist lens, it's not because I think it's all going to be fairies and butterflies, but it's that... Um, there's just more and more of a trust in the evolutionary process of the cosmos. Yeah, I'm struck by, I mean, the direct references and the kind of the, the more implicit references to Richard Tarnas's mm -hmm. work. And I would recommend now for anyone watching this, they haven't read it, the epilogue to Passion of the Western Mind, where he kind of lays out all of that, um, the Stan Groff model and how Western philosophy and Western thought has has created the conditions to give birth to the next thing. And he, he frames that yes. as the return to the intuitive, the return to the feminine. Um, have you read that? It's, it's amazing. I'd, I'd say it's probably had as much impact on me as anything I've ever read. Um, yeah. Rick, Rick's a genius. And it's not, it's not that the West, we have to leave behind rationality. No. It's that we have to synthesize it with these deeply embodied ways of knowing that mm. can complement our abstractive capacities. Yeah. When we do that, and then you hybridize that with artificial intelligence, this is a new thing emerging. Mm -hmm. And I'm starting to trust in that more. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I think. I, I feel that just because whatever is going to emerge is going to only emerge from being able to tap into that still place like collectively and individually where it's going to emerge from panic takes us completely out of the the place of contact with that emergent space yeah. so it's 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 not going to be the thing like if we ever get to the point where we're panicking being overwhelmed by it it's not going to we're not going to make it from there that's almost like that that makes it a self-fulfilling prophecy the kind of the the, the termination narrative yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting. I mean, from a meditative perspective, trust is the key ingredient in t letting your experience unfold in a way that allows it to breathe such that you discover what is being offered to you. And so I think it's, it's, it's perfect what you say, that there's this transition available to, to trusting it, even in the messiness, right? Even in the possibility of uh, collapse of destruction. There's some beauty there. Uh, yeah, I love what you say, Joshua. And to go back to, to just, just in that trust, this, um, how do we cultivate um, stability in our own being? I think when stuff does start to break down, people are going to be searching for, whether they know it or not, game beers. <laughs> like, what is going on and where do we go? And I think to cultivate um, being a pillar of stability amidst the chaos is possibly our greatest service to the world. Yeah. I think uh, in terms of going local, you mentioned the word localism. I think in terms of our offering to our community, and this is a piece that I really want to emphasize because of the impact it's had on my own life and because of the, the what I've read in the literature is this necessity of introducing uh, truth and transparency into relationships. That can we, as we're pillars of stability, also start to encourage truthful and tr transparent communication as much as possible. Because I think one of the meta um, existential risk factors of our times is actually this loss of truth because it's a loss of sense making. Yeah. As organisms, if you, if you cannot sense make in your environment and think about it, we're transitioning more from physical space to digital space. 
digital space, propaganda, fake news, exponentialized disinformation, as Daniel Schmack says. Um, that's an existential risk factor. And what can we do? We're powerless with regards to social media, but can we create containers of trust through truth so that when stuff starts to happen, we have our boys and girls and we can trust. For me, trust is, is a, comes from, from truthfulness. And yeah. I feel like we're, feels like a quite a nice place to wrap up because you just bookmarks it by referring back to Pinker and um, Bendel as kind of the, which is what you said at the beginning. But um, just before we do, is there anything more that's coming up for you that? No, I, I just so appreciate getting to hear your thinking about this more, Joshua. I think uh, it's a bit eerie to me how much what you're saying aligns with how I've, what I've come to feel about what we've been talking about. And uh, I feel a kind of resonance and uh, some level of like validation or kind of uh, encouragement from that uh, a little bit. Then there's a part of me that's also like cautious, like, uh oh, have we been drinking the same Kool-Aid? Uh, but yeah, no, I, I love that I don't really need to add very much. So if you found that conversation useful, I'd highly recommend checking out the films in our members area with Jamie Wheel that we recorded at the recent workshop in London, which was called Collective Sense Making in an Age of Existential Risk and is available for members. I'll run a short clip of that now. Normally, right, that kind of power is reserved for fucking lunatic jihadis, right, bent on destruction, animating from fear and hate. What's possible if we can initiate ourselves in joy and love? All right, it's the samurai notion of meditate on the thousand ways you may die. So that when it comes time to take your stand on the field, you do not flinch. And that's not macabre. That's not morbid. That is not a death wish. Paradoxically, having no regrets, having no hesitation, knowing what my life is for actually massively increases the odds of us getting out of this in a good way. And as always, we can only keep making these films with your help. So if you're enjoying them, please do consider becoming a member, joining the community. We're doing a lot more Q&A calls with the people in our films and building up much more of an online community now in 2020. So look forward to seeing you soon.